Hi, good, good afternoon everyone, or good morning if you're joining us from the West Coast. Welcome to Winning Strategies from Coast to Coast, how EPA's 2017 asthma award winners are addressing asthma disparities. This is a web-based presentation sponsored by the United States Environmental Protection Agency. My name is Tracy Mitchell. I'm a certified asthma educator and an environmental protection specialist at EPA in Washington, D.C., and I will be your facilitator today. We have three uh, dynamic, wonderful speakers with us today, and uh, we'll be turning it over to them in just a minute. Next slide. Um, before we do that, though, I'd like to um, uh, tell you that after immediately following the presentations, our question and answer portion of the webinar will take place on the discussion forum of asthmacommunitynetwork.org. As you see here, there's directions for accessing the discussion forum. And um, to ask a question, you'll first have to be a member of asthmacommunitynetwork.org. Hopefully many of you are, but if you're not, please take a moment now to join so that you can post questions during the webinar and immediately after the webinar. Again, this is a quick and simple process, and we really would like you to be able to join us. After the question and answer period is closed, Please visit the discussion forum often to see others' contributions as well as your own and continue the conversation and the learning that we begin today. Next slide, please. So for today, our plan is to talk about the National Environmental Leadership Award in Asthma Management. I'll begin by presenting some information about the awards program and a framework that many of our award winners have used, uh, which is EPA's System for Developing for, I'm sorry, for delivering high quality asthma care. Then you'll hear from our three speakers, our three asthma award winners, to tell us about their programs and their outstanding results. After the webinar, as I said, each of our presenters will be available for a question and answer period, an interactive um, conversation on Asthma Community Network. Um, to go over today's uh, learning ob objectives, um, the desired outcomes for today's webinar include hearing strategies from the 2017 award winners on building an integrated asthma care system. We'll be learning new approaches for addressing asthma triggers, improving health outcomes, and increasing access to health services. We'll hear best practices for, part, for securing partnerships that address gaps in care, and we'll understand how to effectively track and use program data for sustainability and program growth. Okay, so it looks like we have a great variety of participants today, um, pretty equally split uh, between government agencies, community programs, uh, many healthcare providers, and we're very excited to see so many health plans joining us today. So it looks like Many of you are, are doing home visits, conducting home visits to address asthma triggers. Um, lots of you building partnerships in your community. Um, not so many uh, tracking or maybe having some um, issues with tracking and then other. So um, thank you for participating and sharing uh, your information with us. This will help us not only in today's webinar but in future webinars um, uh, to hear more about the strategies and best practices um, that are necessary for, to, control, to control asthma in your community. As I said, I'd just like to start off by talking a little bit about the National Environmental Leadership Award in Asthma Management. This award is the highest recognition in the country that a program and its leaders can receive for delivering excellent environmental asthma management as part of comprehensive care, as stated in the national guidelines. Um, to, to win the award, uh, Programs have to have a comprehensive approach, and what uh, programs receive when they win the award um, is national recognition through pet press conferences, excuse me, press releases, social media, webinars like the one today, and uh, our speakers are featured at national and regional conferences throughout the year. Um, winners also receive um, a place in the National Hall in the Hall of Fame on asthmacommunitynetwork.org, and an opportunity to serve as mentors for other programs to achieve, achieve impactful results. And you'll hear more about the mentoring uh, a little bit later. 
Since 2005, EPA has recognized health plans, healthcare providers, and communities in action for their best practices in delivering comprehensive asthma care. Over 40 programs have received this national recognition, and you see just see a snapshot of their um, logos on this screen. Um, many, of, as I said, many of these programs have gone on to serve as mentors for others. And today, EPA is pleased to welcome today's three award winners to this prestigious Hall of Fame. So, what does it take to win the award and become a, a ha in the Hall of Fame? Um, as I mentioned earlier, many of our award winners have used EPA's system for developing high-quality asthma care, which features essential components to developing an effective and sustainable asthma program. As you see on the screen, the system is a conceptual framework based on the results of the Asthma Health Outcomes Project conducted several years ago by the University of Michigan. The project identified the core elements of a successful asthma program and the processes that drive implementation, continuous improvement, and endurance or sustainability. You see those circles in the middle describe the five key drivers, and those are committed leaders and champions, strong community ties, integrated healthcare services, tailored environmental interventions, and high-performing collaborations. The system is flexible and dynamic, and its effectiveness results from ongoing interaction between those five main key drivers or components in the middle. Any asthma program, regardless of its size, budget, target community, or level of development, can use the system to guide its work. And it, you can access uh, the system on asthmacommunitynetwork.org. So let's focus on just a couple of the key drivers that you'll hear about today in our presentations. Um, a core feature of an effective asthma program is tailored environmental services. This key driver includes educating care teams on environmental triggers, employing techniques for minimizing trigger exposure, providing patient education, and referring patients to environmental services. Two essential strategies of this driver, which you'll hear about from our speakers, are providing tailored education and counseling services during clinic visits. So this means ensuring that uh, the care teams educate patients about identifying, controlling, and avoiding their triggers, and tailoring the recommended interventions to the specific patient sensitivities. Also, promoting in-home environmental trigger management. As you'll hear from many of our um, speakers, partnering with local services to provide home assessments and interventions and teaching patients to manage uh, their home environments, often in real time in their homes, is an important component of, of their program. But we know it, you can't do it alone. Partnering organizations are key to providing a high level of asthma care. Many of our speakers have connected with organizations um, in their communities to connect patients with much needed additional services. And so a couple of aspects of high performing collaborations, again, that you'll hear about today and want you to listen for, are building um, on what works. And that's building partnerships with organizations that are active in the community and seeking out organizations to provide complementary services. If you're not offering a service, you find a partner who can offer complementary services um, that helps foster those collaborations. And also collaborating to build credibility. Um, collaborating to establish, with established organizations to build social and capital, um, the co social and capital infrastructure of your program and to, again, give credibility to all, everyone involved. Each of these programs today will describe how they reached out to the organizations in their community to collaborate and um, to serve underserved populations. You'll hear some in innovative and creative solutions that demonstrate the value of thinking outside the box and how, the, how to build community support and buy-in. So without further ado, um, let's start on the East Coast in Richmond, Virginia. I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Kathleen Bowden. She's an asthma social worker from the UCAN program at Children's Hospital of Richmond at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. And uh, UCAN is this year's winner in the healthcare provider category. So welcome, Kathleen. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you to the EPA for recognizing the UCAM program. 
Um, it's a real pleasure to participate with you on the webinar today. So as you shared, my name is Kathleen Bowden. I'm the asthma social worker for the UCAN program. Our program is based in Richmond, Virginia. So Richmond has been named the number one most challenging place to live with asthma for three out of the last five years, and that's from the Asthma Capitals report published by the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. Richmond has a worse than average asthma death rate and number of emergency room visits for asthma. And the average pediatric asthma hospitalization rate in the Richmond metropolitan area is more than twice that of the overall Virginia, um, Virginia average. So the prevalence of asthma is twice as high in minority children, and the rates of emergency room visits, hospitalizations, and deaths due to asthma are three times higher. And although the reasons for these disparities are complex, economic, social, and cultural factors, what we call the social determinants of health, add to the greater asthma burden among these groups. So in 2015, Dr. Michael Schechter, he approached the Children's Hospital of Richmond Foundation to create a program that would address the asthma outcome disparities evident in the low-income population of pediatric asthma patients in the Richmond metropolitan area. So far, we've um, enrolled about 393 patients since 2015. So the goals for our program are pretty straightforward. Um, it's to improve health outcomes for low-income um, patients in the Richmond area with asthma. Um, we are, have three major areas where we're accepting referrals. And the first is children who are hospitalized at Children's Hospital of Richmond for asthma exacerbations. Um, also children with two or more emergency department visits to VCU for asthma in the previous 12 months, as well as children with asthma who are referred from the community or their primary care doctor who have limited income and resources. So, our patients at this point, they tend to be, as you can see, mostly Medicaid patients. 79% of our patients receive Medicaid. 16% have um, commercial insurance. 4% are uninsured. And the remaining 1% usually has to do with TRICARE. So we have three major areas of things that we do in UCAN, and that is providing medical treatments. We're providing education and disease self-management. And we're providing psychosocial environmental supports for them. Um, specifically, we're trying to provide patient-centered, culturally sensitive, relationship-based medical care. And what that means is people are going to have consistent providers each time that they come. We're going to have frequent and regular follow-up with them. They have 24-hour phone access to ask questions or if they're dealing with an asthma exacerbation. And educational support that's provided at every visit and every contact that promotes disease self-management. We do case management services. That ensures coordination of their needed care for scheduling, transportation, and making sure that other members of the family also have an asthma assessment completed. We're also providing screening and follow-up on social issues, so mental health issues, food and housing issues, advocacy, and legal assistance. And we're also providing home visits. So we're, again, we're talking about the environmental assessment and interventions on that level. So education is a huge component of what we do. Um, these are some of the educational handouts we use for patients and their parents. All are written for lower literacy individuals, and we're currently having all of these handouts translated into Spanish. We're about halfway done. Um, we try to never hand a family a handout, an educational sheet, um, and that's it. As that's almost a certain guarantee it will end up in the trash can. So any educational material that we share, we review verbally with the family. And reaching patients and families with a variety of education enables us to share information in a way that's most effective. So we're using video, comics, we're providing inhaler labels to decrease medication um, confusion. And we're reaching out also to the broader community. That could be through advertorials in the local urban newspaper, um, bus back advertising, Facebook posts, in addition to presence at community health fairs, school nurse conferences, and at schools themselves for training. With, for us, our outreach and engagement is super important for us. Um, there are a couple questions that we're attempting to answer for our patients, and that is why should they follow up with us, and what do we offer our patients of value in addition to the excellent asthma care that we provide. So UCAN staff, we visit patients in the hospital and their families in the hospital when they're hospitalized. There we can begin assessment, we can begin education, and we're introducing service providers. After they're discharged from the hospital, um, we give them a call to answer questions. Again, we're trying to create that relationship so that they can follow up in clinic. 
Um, and then we've recently initiated a text messaging um, asthma tips that they get once a week. It's small tips to reinforce learning and reinforce the relationship with us. We utilize reports created by the hospital, and that's to identify patients who've utilized the emergency department two or more times for an asthma-related diagnosis, for an outreach phone call, and an invitation for services. If patients miss appointments, we are making phone calls to them, and we're doing periodic outreach phone calls to those with no appointments to assess their status, answer questions. Our team is made up of pulmonologists, an asthma nurse, nurse practitioner, asthma social worker, respiratory therapist, clinic nurses, and LPNs. Um, the pulmonologists, obviously, they're the experts in asthma care and management. They're assuring appropriate diagnosis and treatment. Um, our nurse is a certified asthma educator. She provides asthma education during each visit. She's coordinating services also between pharmacies, schools, primary care. She's conducting initial assessments and outreach in the hospital for hospitalized patients and doing outreach and follow-up between visits or after missed appointments. The asthma social worker and myself, I'm doing psychosocial and environmental assessments for barriers to treatment and to controlling their asthma. Um, I'm doing a lot of providing appropriate referrals to ameliorate or correct issues that are brought up. Again, doing initial assessments at the hospital and outreach um, and follow-up between visits, and outreach for those who've been into the ED um, more than twice in the last 12 months. Our respiratory therapists, they're conducting pulmonary function tests. They're reinforcing the asthma education. They're reinforcing proper inhaler and spacer usage. And our clinic nurses and LPNs, they are our initial front door contact. So the initial physical intake and history, they're administering the asthma control test or the pediatric asthma control test, which we provide at each visit. And as we were saying earlier, our program, we can't do every single thing, so our community partners are incredibly important for us. Um, the medical legal partnership here at VCU is important to us. They work with patients primarily at this point around issues related to substandard housing due to landlord negligence. So we have an aging housing stock in Richmond, and some landlords don't properly maintain their units, leading to mold issues or water leaks and damage, safety hazards due to falling tiles or vents left unmaintained for years. And we've just recently obtained permission to begin referring other types of legal issues to the partnership, such as SFI appeals or even IEP advocacy in the schools. The, healthy, the Richmond City Health District Lead Safe and Healthy Homes initiative, initiative has also been really important for us. Um, they're able to go into the homes of our pediatric asthma patients and conduct an environmental assessment of possible triggers in the home um, for those who live in the city of Richmond. They provide guidance on fixing any environmental issues, and at times they're able to provide things like environmentally friendly cleaning supplies or other supplies like an air filter or a humidity monitor. Family Lifeline has an asthma home visiting program, another one of our partners. They can see patients within seven miles of their office to provide in-home asthma education and support. And Family Lifeline is also a referral partner to help support parents of young children um, in their parent education home visiting program. School nurses, we coordinate with school nurses around having current asthma action plans, educating teachers, and for some patients, we have arrangements where they receive their controller inhaler at school during the week. And then we also coordinate with care managers and primary care offices for outreach and asthma education. So it's important that we are able to share what impacts we're having and seeing for our patients and families through connection with UCAN. So we're able to pull hospital and clinic data through our hospital analytics. And then we also evaluate changes in number of sick visits, number of prescriptions of prednisone, um, as well as track which educational topics we're providing for patients through a separate database. This slide speaks specifically to utilization and cost changes for the hospital and clinic um, since we began. Now, when we looked at this, you'll see we have a range. And so when we evaluated utilization and cost, we looked at it with or without the index visit. Um, and that means with or without that first visit in the hospital when we first made contact with them. We also looked at for all patients that we've seen and for those who have come into the clinics that we call engaged patients. And then also we looked at um, those visits that were just for asthma-related diagnosis codes and then for all hospital encounters, which could be they had a stomach virus or they had an earache or they fell and broke their arm. So what we couldn't evaluate was non-Children's Hospital of Richmond encounters or medication costs. But what you can tell is that we've had a decrease in cost from 48 to 66 percent. So we've saved anywhere from $152,000 to a little over $1.4 million um, 
And we put that range there because we want to be as accurate, you know, as we can, and we are still tailoring our data. That is it from here. So I look forward to answering your questions at the conclusion of the webinar. Great. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Um, you really do have your challenges there in Richmond, uh, Virginia. I uh, had no idea that um, uh, you were ranked so highly three out of the last five years. <clears throat> Excuse me, but what a great um, example of high-performing collaborations, working with your community partners, the school nurses you mentioned, the medical legal partnership, and your healthy homes partnership, and achieving really significant health outcomes. So congratulations to you. Um, now let's take a visit to the Midwest. Our next speaker is Bridget Burke from Healthcare Service Corporation. Bridget is joining us from Chicago, Illinois, although the program itself serves five states, Illinois, Montana, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas. And um, HCSC is this year's health plan winner, and uh, welcome, Bridget. Great. Thank you, Tracy, for the introduction and to the EPA for this tremendous recognition and the opportunity to uh, join today's discussion alongside uh, my fellow honorees. Um, and I just want to say that while I'm here representing uh, Healthcare Service Corporation, I want to point out that this honor is absolutely shared with our key partner in tackling asthma, the American Lung Association, uh, specifically their Upper Midwest chapter. And on the next slide, I'll get into a little more background on who we are to help provide some context around our organization for those of you who are not familiar with HCS, HCSC. As Tracy mentioned, uh, we're comprised of uh, five different Blue Cross and Blue Shield plans across five states, Illinois, Montana, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas. We serve around 15 million members. Uh, we have about 21,000 employees and operate out of uh, 60 different offices. <clears throat> I work within our strategy and corporate relations team, which provides oversight and accountability to our company's uh, varying social responsibility efforts, which span both local level and company-wide community involvement activities, diversity and inclusion efforts, uh, deploying sustainable practices, providing a robust employee wellness program, and our ever-important ethics and compliance efforts, which I accidentally omitted from this slide, but should absolutely be noted. And then on the next slide, we'll get more into the details around one of these programs that intersects significantly with our company's uh, asthma efforts. And that interse intersection takes place through our company-wide community investment initiative, Healthy Kids, Healthy Families. This is our company's signature community involvement program that brings together all of our health plans across all of our five states to really rally behind and support specific areas of focus that significantly impact our communities. You'll see our main focus areas include addressing food security, keeping people active, preventing and managing uh, varying disease and, diseases and chronic conditions, in addition to allowing for for a holistic approach to well-being by supporting safe and secure environments. Through this initiative, we find, fund, and partner with local nonprofit organizations delivering services within these pillars. Since the initiative began in 2011, we've invested more than $47 million across our communities uh, through these partnerships, uh, generating over 21 million health and wellness services, and last year alone we impacted about 2.5 million children through this effort. This initiative really brought, uh, brought upon much needed change within our community investment strategy and allowed, and allowed for greater focus and accountability and, and a real shift away from the days of checkbook philanthropy where you're spraying a whole lot of money into the community with dozens and dozens and sometimes even hundreds of partners uh, and simply hoping for the best rather than really driving outcomes that are mutually beneficial to all uh, involved parties. To ensure that we are aligned with business outcomes and community needs, uh, we use our own claims data to identify conditions that are incredibly prevalent across our communities and also very costly to our company. I'm sure it's no surprise to those on this call that asthma is always in the top 10 in terms of pre prevalence and cost, and that spans almost every age group, every product line, and um, all geographies we serve. So using these data, we proactively reach out to community partners across our communities that are experts in these fields to address these conditions and that also share in common goals of improving the quality of life while also uh, for individuals impacted with these varying conditions while also reducing avoidable and inappropriate health care utilization, which helps to drive down the cost of care for everyone and also helps to make the health care system work better and harder for everyone. 
So we engaged with conversations uh, to, to many partners and came across the American Lung Association and learned uh, about a great program they had piloted within one community and worked with them to expand that program across our five states um, and also utilized our medical claims data to target uh, health centers and clinics serving some of our most high-risk uh, high risk patients with asthma to ensure that our efforts were targeted to those with the greatest need. While we use data to target uh, key geographic areas of impa impact, it's it's really important to note that this, in, this effort impacts the community at large and is not exclusive to those who purchase our products. On the next slide, uh, you'll see uh, we partner with the American Lung Association in three key ways. <clears throat> Through the Enhancing Care for Children, oh, we can go back one slide. Thank you. Through the Enhancing Care for Children with Asthma program, we work with the American Lung Association to recruit primary care clinics to take part in a year-long asthma quality improvement initiative where the American Lung Association of the Upper Midwest delivers trainings, tools, and resources to these clinics to improve the quality of care being delivered to their patients with asthma. The clinics meet monthly with the American Lung Association staff to tackle the entire spectrum of care as it relates to asthma, including proper diagnosis through spirometry, capturing severity ratings, uh, greater uh, adherence to administering and using asthma action plans, uh, pe uh, patient education around medical utilization, in addition to many more topics. <clears throat> We've also recently expanded the partnership to include home-based assessments and solutions to reduce and remove the environmental triggers um, and provide patient education to those who still struggle with better daily management of their asthma. We additionally build capacity through community health initiatives to support the provider, school, patient, parent, and caregiver communities with best practices, tools, and resources, and trainings to reach beyond the clinics and individuals engaged through the home-based uh, visits. And on the next slide, we'll get more into the details around the quality improvement piece of this partnership. <clears throat> The objectives of this initiative are to deliver guidelines-based care within the primary healthcare clinic environment um, that also emphasizes strong, comprehensive asthma uh, self-management component as part of patient and parent and or caregiver education and support. Using our claims data, we identify clinics serving some of the most high-risk patients with asthma across our communities. The American Lung Association then comes in as a trusted ally and expert within the asthma space and a neutral convener to train and support these clinics. Health insurers can sometimes be met with resistance when tackling condition management, so partnering with the American Lung Association has been incredibly successful in building trust and lowering resistance to embracing these types of support models. And the Quality Improvement Initiative has proven to work in a variety of clinic settings, including school-based clinics. We knew from the start that it would take time to see an outcome as we were working to increase the quality of care being delivered and also change behavior. But we wanted to set up some indicators along the way to ensure we were moving in the right direction. So we identified six quality improvement in indicators <clears throat> and we asked clinics to submit case studies to demonstrate their adherence to these indicators. And on the next slide, you'll see that across these six indicators, clinics were reporting that they were using their training and improving in all areas. Even better, <clears throat> they were improving after the year-long training ended, demonstrating su uh, sustainable change within the clinic that doesn't end just when the training does. The assumption was that if the quality of care being delivered was improving, then the quality of life for those individuals would improve, and we would see that through better, uh, better asthma management with less hospitalizations and fewer department, uh, emergency department visits. And on the next slide, we'll see if that assumption was correct. And the great news is, it was. Uh, we looked at the medical utilization for individuals with asthma a year before the intervention, the year during, and the year after. And you'll see that uh, both children and adults had significant reductions in hospitalizations and emergency department visits, on average overall, less, uh, more than 50% reductions. And in some clinics, we had reductions as much as 80% when we uh, isolated those clinics specifically. So people are staying out of the hospital, they're not missing school and or work and are uh, managing their symptoms better on a daily basis. And <clears throat> anecdotally, we're hearing from the clinics that we're working with that <clears throat> this is really strengthening provider relationships between our organizations and that we're really seen as a, uh, a partner within this space and not just a payer. 
And on the next slide, we'll get a little bit into the ROI that we were able to capture. So you can see here, for every dollar we invested in the effort, we were able to save the company about $2.40. Again, this helps to support our business, drive down the cost of care for all, and help the healthcare system make uh, healthcare system work better and harder for everyone. And what the case studies and the data and the ROI measures don't show are the amazing stories that we're uncovering around children, adults, and families who are able to lead healthier and more productive lives. We share some of these stories on a web platform we have developed where you can learn more about the partnership, download free tools and resources such as asthma action plans, and uh, hear some of these great stories of impact. So you can check out uh, takingonasthma.com to learn more. And while our partnership was initially focused on the clinic environment, we discovered that some patients were still not able to control their asthma. So we further expanded the partnership to include in-home health assessments, uh, which we'll get more into on the next slide. Based mostly on provider referrals, the American Lung Association will deploy certified asthma educators into the homes of patients with asthma to educate them and their families on how to reduce and remove environmental triggers that provide uh, that prevent better daily asthma management. We interact with these individuals on a minimum of three times. The first is to introduce the program, the goals, and to schedule a home visit. The second is the initial visit, visit with a home assessment and basic asthma education. And then the third uh, being a follow-up visit to deliver the products, train families on how to use them, and provide more in-depth education on the areas uh, that are still needed to be addressed within the home. And we're finding that the most common asthma triggers identified are dust, carpet, uh, harmful or strong cleaning uh, agents, air fresheners, candles, insects, and pet dander. These home visits have provided incredible insight for our asthma exer experts who then bring that information back to the overall partnership and identify ways to tackle some of these issues in the clinic environment and through large-scale awareness campaigns to share the lessons learned with as many uh, people as possible. And while the expansion into home visits is relatively a new component to the program, we uh, a review of a previous participant a review of previous participants found that there was a statistically significant reduction in daytime and nighttime symptoms and functional limitations from baseline to 12 months after. And then if we can go into the next slide, I can just provide a quick uh, snapshot of what we've accomplished to date through this partnership. So you'll see um, over the last five years, we have. We have engaged more than 120 uh, primary health care clinics across our five states. We've supported about 2,000 community edu education and outreach activities that have uh, assisted more than 190,000 health care and school professionals in addition to parents and caregivers of children with asthma. We've completed more than 140 home assessments and also provided solutions for redu uh, removing and reducing triggers. And overall, the program impact has been a little over 500,000 individuals. For those of you considering how best to, to, excuse me, to deploy programming or how you can set yourself up for success as you develop programs, I just want to reiterate a few key points. First, collaboration and partnerships are essential, essential uh, especially when each partner leverages their assets and expertise and understands that they all need each other to be successful. Second, making significant changes takes time. Manage expectations up front that will take time to measure an outcome and give your program appropriate time to grow. And third, understanding these outcomes do take time. Set up indicators and milestones uh, to reach along the way to success so that you are monitoring progress closely and can jump in and course correct when needed. Being nimble and adaptable is crucial. So thank you again for this recognition and the opportunity to share our story. And with that, I'll kick it back to Tracy. Great. Thank you so much, Bridget. I couldn't have recapped it better myself. Some really great insights and um, great examples of high-performing collaborations with your partnership with the American Lung Association of the Upper Midwest. And kudos to you and your team for being partners, not just payers. I love that. Um, thank you. So our final stop today is on the West Coast um, with this year's Community in Action uh, winner. Our next speaker is Amelia Faye Burquist. She is, a health, she is the Healthy Breathing Program Manager for Esperanza Community Housing Corporation in Los Angeles, California. Welcome, Amelia. 
Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Um, like Tracy said, my name is Amelia Faye Burquist, and I'm the Healthy Breathing Program Manager here at Esperanza Community Housing Corporation. And um, we are so honored and privileged to be um, awarded this um, this really incredible recognition by the EPA. So I really want to say thank you um, to the EPA for that. But also, it's just such a, a privilege to be on, in partnership or in community with um, the other awardees. Uh, as I'm sitting here, my jaws just dropping as, as both Kathleen and Bridget were going through their slides and speaking to their program successes. And um, so anyway, so we are Esperanza Community Housing Corporation, and um, I will refer to it probably mostly as Esperanza as, as I move through this presentation. But we are a nonprofit community-based organization here in South Central Los Angeles, which um, Many of you probably know South LA is an area that has unfortunately experienced um, a legacy of disinvestment and structural inequities, and as a result, um, the communities in South LA experienced the greatest health disparities. And so this organization was created back in 1989 um, to address both health and housing um, here in South Los Angeles, um, specific to eliminating slum housing, creating affordable housing, um, and uh, and looking at the connection and the correlation between health and housing. Um, and so, anyway, w um, our organization focuses in on health promotion through direct services. Um, over the last almost 30 years, we have worked on issues of lead uh, and lead exposure here in Los Angeles. 80% uh, of our housing stock was built before 1979, so lead exposure, particularly in South LA, is a, a, a very um, important and relevant issue. Residential oil drilling is also an issue in South LA, and so we do a lot of direct services and advocacy work around um, making sure that companies that are drilling, um, number one, uh, should not be allowed to do so, but also that there's policy work around the regulatory aspect of it as well. We also do a lot of support work with families with developmental, uh, children with developmental disabilities. Um, and then, of course, we do asthma work. Uh, and then through our policy uh, platforms. We are a member of several coalitions that complement our direct services, um, and we also do a lot of stuff around creating healthy and affordable housing um, policies that sustain our families here in South LA. And then lastly, we are an affordable housing owner, so we actually own nine buildings um, of affordable housing here in South, South Los Angeles, which, as you can imagine, um, there's not a whole lot of turnover because it's hard to find affordable homes um, in all of Los Angeles and, and more so even today in South LA, um, but also uh, healthy housing um, that is free of uh, landlord negligence and habitability conditions that compromise our health. So moving on to the next slide. So this is a little bit about the Healthy Breathing Program interview, and I uh, this picture here was really important to me to include at the uh, you know at, at the, the get go of this presentation because the Healthy Breathing Program, which was a pilot project from 2013 to 2016, um, was run by the folks in this picture: um, Ashley Kissinger, who was the program manager and moved on to get her um, her PhD. I just wanted to acknowledge her and all of her hard work, but also the promotores that are in this picture, um, Maria and Consuelo, the two women on the left, they are still with the Healthy Breathing Program, um, and Toby recently left, but all three of them are graduates and alumni of our Community Health Promotora Program, which is a six-month robust um, uh, community health promoter training um, that we have had now going for 20 years, and we have trained over 400 community health workers that work specifically in the South LA area, so I just really wanted to acknowledge them. Um, but anyway, so the history. So in 1998, um, we, uh, our Healthy Homes program is what preceded our Healthy Breathing program. In 1998, Healthy Homes program began with a HUD outreach grant, and it was specifically to work with families living in a census tract in South LA that had been identified as a lead hot zone. And so lead became kind of the first element of the Healthy Homes program here at Esperanza. But because promotoras wear both a health promotion hat, but also that of a social worker hat, um, they are always supporting families and the multitude of challenges that they may be experiencing. So while 
led uh, was something that was a target in terms of identifying and working with those families. Families oftentimes um, living in compromised housing may also have asthma. And also here in South Los Angeles, um, South LA is locked in by a square of freeways. And so outdoor air is also an issue on top of indoor air that could be caused by compromised housing conditions due to landlord negligence and slum housing. So anyway, um, so the healthy housing or the Healthy Homes program has been supporting families with asthma for almost 20 years, even while the lack of resources didn't allow us to necessarily collect data or provide asthma-specific support like we do now with Healthy Breathing. But that was really our first venture into uh, supporting folks with asthma. So in 2011, Esperanza was a recipient of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. It was a HUD grant for our Healthy Homes program, and for the first time, Esperanza was targeting asthmatics in the in-home triggers as a healthy home issue. And the Healthy Homes team, what they noticed was that there was a big reduction in emergency room use that was, that was uh, illustrated in the data. And so the Healthy Homes team decided to follow up with the families to ask what they believed were the driving forces behind their reduction in emergency department use, and the answer was the in-home promotora visits. So next slide, please. So with that, the Healthy Breathing Pilot Project was born. And so from 2013 to 2016, uh, Esperanza received a three-year UNIHealth-funded grant to partner with California Hospital Medical Center here in Los Angeles. And they are at essentially the northern tip of South LA. And South LA is a very large area. So it actually, in terms of who we were receiving referrals from, it didn't necessarily reflect all of South LA. And I'll follow up to that point um, as we move on. But anyway, so Esperanza, the Healthy Breathing team was receiving referrals for, from the emergency department for every single pediatric asthmatic that came in for care. Um, community health promoters with asthma were dispatched to the family, um, and it was a 12-month enrollment in the Healthy Breathing program. So a promotor or a promotora uh, conducted four visits over the course of those 12 months. The first visit was always the most critical because not only did we engage in a really robust survey, but that was where we were um, capturing really, number one, building relationships with the family where trust is really steeped in that first initial visit or building it, um, but also understanding the, the broader um, experience of that family and understanding what their needs and their priorities were so that we could help. Um, like I said, oftentimes you go into a home and asthma is not necessarily the only thing or the number one priority, so we were always um, figuring out how to support families also so that they felt they trusted us but felt, felt compelled to engage in the asthma component primarily of our uh, support of the family. So the goals of the Healthy Breathing Pilot Project were first and foremost to reduce emergency department use by pediatric asthmatics in South LA. So this was a one referral source pro, um, project um, around pediatric asthmatics. Uh, conversely, it was to increase control of asthma by pediatric asthmatics. Um, it was also uh, one of the goals was to ensure asthmatics had a medical home for consistent ongoing asthma care and to get them away from the emergency department unless there was a, a, an emergency and growing the evidence base of the impact of in-home health programming. So how did we do this? Um, number one, asthma education. So we do a huge piece of asthma education with the family where we're talking about the physiology of asthma, where we're talking about proper medication administration, where we're doing a lot of visual engagement with the family because our health promotion model is really steeped in a popular education model um, where we don't assume or presume that families, that uh, reading and words are the number one way to convey information and to increase education and understanding understanding of the complexities of something like asthma. So another thing that we do is an env environmental assessment. So doing an a visual inspection of the home to understand what the indoor environmental triggers might be, cockroaches, both causal and um, uh, uh, 
capacity to uh, exacerbate um, an asthma, uh, an asthmatics condition. Looking at mold and for water intrusion, areas of heavy dust, again, as families are living by main thoroughfares, we've got a ton of arterial roads within the South LA area on top of the, uh, the really busy highway system. So understanding uh, what could be coming into the home, that could also be a trigger. Um, and, and then working with the family to create a plan to eliminate those triggers. Uh, another thing that I think is one of the big things that uh, makes our program so successful is that we are, we were funded during that, pro, uh, that pr the pilot project to do, to not only do uh, environmental assessments and to do education, but to provide materials that are oftentimes just too costly, particularly for low income, low resource families to attain and therefore mitigate the triggers that are happening. And so we can provide air spacers or air chambers and spacers for the asthmatic, providing uh, air purifiers and HEPA filter vacuums, um, giving families mattress and pillow covers and microfiber mops. And of course, with families, one of the things that we did in our, uh, in our initial visit with the family is understanding what they do to clean and, and specifically what they use to clean. And what, we, what is pretty common that we find is that families with asthmatics are oftentimes cleaning a lot and cleaning excessively because they're trying to make the, the healthiest environment for their family. But as we are all conditioned to believe that Clorox bleach and that Pine Sol and Fabuloso, that these are items that, uh, that create cleanliness, they're actually also really, really toxic and triggers to the family. So we give every family a lung-friendly cleaning bucket, and we work with them and together make the solution uh, that is hydrogen peroxide and baking soda, and we supply boric acid for families that are experiencing a cockroach infestation. We provide microfiber towels that are reusable and dust masks. And so every family gets that on top of other materials that they need unique to themselves. And then lastly, what the pilot project did um, was resource referrals. And so again, for families that were using the ED as essentially a primary care um, resource for their child with asthma, we wanted to get families connected to FQHCs and medical homes here in South LA to make sure that they had consistent and comprehensive care, um, but also connecting families with other community-based organizations around needs specific to housing rights, tenants' rights, legal aid, and the other you know resources that were addressing the multitude of, of challenges that the family might be um, asking for support on. And then also government agencies, learning how to navigate them. Here in Los Angeles City, we have a really fantastic housing department that does really robust uh, housing inspections. We also have the LA County Department of Public Health, um, and both of those are government agencies that we rely upon to help achieve healthy homes here in Los Angeles, particularly when landlords are uh, not invested in sustaining a healthy uh, property. And then lastly, growing the evidence base through data collection. So in our survey, we collected data, baseline data, and also over the course of those 12 months, we collected follow-up data on program impacts and capturing the broader narrative of the asthmatics history. Um, so again, that we could um, understand what the impact was, but also to tailor our services and our support to each family. So next slide are the results of that pilot project from 2013 to 2016. So as you see, they were dramatic and uh, very inspiring and really exciting. But what we saw was that 76% of enrollees did not return to the ED after receiving a home visit from the Healthy Breathing Team. So that was very much akin to what the Healthy Homes Program had found um, when we had the ARA grant. Um, there was 160% improvement in the asthma control test scores. Um, missed school days went down over a six-month period. Um, folks, you know, almost 100% of families were not correctly administering prescription medication, but at six at six month follow-up, 84% were administering it correctly. That was a huge gain um, in success and from our program. 97% of families switched to the lung-friendly cleaning products, and 99% of families made lung-friendly changes to their home. And so uh, it goes without saying that there was a huge, enormous success from this program. Um, and so next slide, where are we today? So um, we are
are very lucky to have been awarded another three-year UNAHealth grant, um, and we are now a, what we identify as a permanent program, so we're no longer piloting anything. We know that it works, um, so we're working to make it better. But the program evolution, so now what we um, are doing is we have another three-year grant to continue with this work. Uh, we are now a standalone program, so we're able to accept referrals from any source, which really enables us to look at data that is out there and understand in South LA where the greatest disparities exist. Um, and we're also now serving asthmatics of all ages, which is really incredible because we see differences in morbidity and mortality among asthma depending on ages, particularly around pediatric and adults. And so it really opens up um, our capacity to cast the widest net and serve those number one greatest in need, but also um, those that we weren't able to capture during our um, and during our pilot. Number two, um, we are really, really committed to strategic outreach and building partnerships across South LA. And so, and that is through a, a plethora of mediums. So, of course, medical, so building relationships with hospitals and sustaining relationships with hospitals as well and clinics. Um, identifying sole practitioners in those small little practices that are on corners and neighborhoods that we wouldn't necessarily find um, by looking them up, uh, you know, on Google or they don't necessarily have websites and that kind of thing. And so, um, for example, uh, one of the things that, that we were just doing a couple of weeks ago is that we pulled all of our data from uh, who we have been serving so far, and we looked at where the uh, – where the uh, distribution was in the South LA area, and we identified areas of, hey, why is there a gap in this particular area of South LA? Let's go down there. So we created a map. We identified places to go um, in terms of doing outreach and creating conversations and starting part potential partnerships. And we got in the car and we went down and we hit every resource over the course of five hours within that small little area so that we can start to um, hopefully capture as many asthmatics in that area as possible because we know they are there. Um, another strategic outreach is to senior centers and to churches and other community-based organizations and parent groups and just areas where we know folks are. Um, and I also, in this moment, really want to acknowledge two particular folks, and Andrea Williams, who's the executive director of the, the Southside Coalition of Community Health Centers here in, in South Los Angeles. Um, they are a coalition with nine FQHCs who we actually are next door neighbors, and she has been a huge champion of helping us create greater friendships and partnerships with uh, FQHCs here in South LA. But also um, uh, Felix Dominguez, who's a case manager and asthma coordinator with uh, Eisner Pediatrics which has been a long-term partner of us, but he has also really championed it. And, um, and I think that that is part, you know, they are two key people and really, really who reflect how we can create great success of this program with the support of partners and, uh, and friends, right? So, um, so how have we done this? Again, it's through team networks. It's, we are also signing up for every event where community members are coming through. Um, and we're creating target maps and dropping in. Um, and lastly, data. Um, growing our data capacities and building a culture of data around healthy breathing has been really, really key as we have started our second cycle of the Healthy Breathing Program. So what, how has that been, or how have we achieved that? It's through improving our survey instruments. We did a huge overhaul so that we could really ensure that we were capturing key data points that are really important to us understanding how asthma functions for families on the ground. So what do we want want to know that wasn't necessarily captured before. One of the big things that we have now integrated is understanding and capturing psychosocial triggers um, so that we can really also capture how poverty-related issues are driving asthma outcomes and disparities. Um, and we were able to do that with the help of a really incredible intern from Charles Drew, who's a biostatistician, and she was also an MPH student. Her name was Brandy Loper, and we uh, really we have an incredible survey instrument now because of her partnership with us here. Um, and then growing the data, we're collecting so much information now when we really want that information to reflect the multilayered complexities of the local 
potential asthma epidemic in South LA, what it looks like, and also have the capacity to share that data with our friends and partners doing work so that those that are doing things around urban planning and housing and climate change are indirectly going to impact um, asthma outcomes. And then lastly, since we are no longer tethered to one referral source, one of the fundamental goals of Healthy Breathing is that we are connecting with and in service to those in our catchment area where the data shows the greatest disparities. So for example, we know that black and African American children experience the greatest asthma morbidity, while black and African American adults experience the greatest mortality of asthma. So I think one of the key questions that we are asking ourselves now is, with displacement, of black folks in South LA, which is something that has been happening for 25 years now, and the scattering of community um, in both the city and county of LA, how do we conduct outreach to ensure we're serving those most in need when community is not necessarily um, any longer confined to a particular geographic space? So. In sum, we know that the Healthy Breathing program works. We know that our community health promoter model works and is positively impacting the most vulnerable asthmatics in LA. So now it's about becoming better and more strategic so that our reach is greater and our ability to understand how each facet of our program is affecting as, uh, asthma outcomes in LA um, is as great as it can be. So thank you so much to everybody. Wow, fabulous. Thank you so much, Amelia. What a great example of um, using tailored environmental interventions through home visits conducted by the community health worker or the promotoras, and a great example of a pilot showing um, results so that you were able to grow, sustain, not only sustain, but then grow the program. Great. So it looks like we've got a lot of interest in tracking data to identify um, key program results and making the business case. Um, so I'll just put a plug in that there are a lot of really great resources on Asthma Community Network uh, in the meantime before we can put together another webinar to address these. And there are webinars that have been archived on Asthma Community Network um, that actually do address making the business case for your program. So thank you again for your participation. Um, I'd like to go ahead and thank our uh, award winners again and congratulate each one of them. Um, thank them for the time and the effort that they put in for today's presentations, being able to share the information about their successful programs with you. Um, before we head to asthmacommunitynetwork.org for the question and answer period, um, I'll just go ahead and repost some of the, di the directions to uh, join us at the discussion forum. Uh, please log into Asthma Community Network and uh, go to the discussion forum on the left. You'll be able to post questions, and there's actually been uh, some folks posting questions during the webinar, so that's really exciting. Join us there to have access to these speakers and to um, be able to interact with them for the next 30 minutes until 3.30. Um, please visit asthmacommunitynetwork.org in the future to be able to archive again this webinar and other webinars and also be able to archive the discussion questions and answers in the future. You can also read more about these award-winning programs and our, all of our previous award winners on the Hall of Fame site on asthmacommunitynetwork.org. So again, thank you for joining us today and we look forward to chatting with you soon on the discussion forum. That concludes today's webinar.